thing that I've always found a little annoying throughout hip hop history is when we criminally underrate an artist that made a huge impact or was hot for at least one or two years, then it seems like they almost quietly go away. Now, there's a bunch of different artists I could bring up, but one that's always came to my mind first has got to be Craig Mack. Now, do you think I'm crazy when I say I feel Craig Mack has been criminally underrated when we talk about his career? Not at all. I totally agree. Craig Mack set Bad Boy off. Like, if it wasn't for... I'm not going to say if it wasn't for Craig Mack, Bad Boy would have never been what it is, but... The facts of the matter is, Craig Mack was the one that set the whole everything off and created that that bad boy momentum. Because Biggie was around for a while. Like, he was on Mary J. Blige, Real Love Remix. He was on the Who's the Man soundtrack with Party and Bullshit. Like, he was, like, around, lingering around for years. He couldn't catch on. And when Craig Mack came with that flavor in your ear, it was just like totally something just different. Like he like shifted the whole sound of the industry. You know what I'm saying? Like shifted the whole the pace, everything. Like so Craig Mack, man. Craig Mack is definitely underrated. I think it got yeah. a lot to do with him being blackballed. That's what I think. Because, you know, like Puffy blackballed him. Okay, so from the outside looking in, it kind of seems that way, as if they had an issue and then just Puffy never really elaborated. So you definitely think he was by fault, or is there something out there that maybe I just haven't seen? I, def I definitely think he's blackballed. The reason why I say that is I did a show with Craig Mack in Puerto Rico one time. You know what I'm saying? And that was when I first met him. And the, the promoter that flew us over there for the show had us in the same hotel and our rooms was literally like on the same floor. Um, the, pro the, the promoter that flew us over there to Puerto Rico, he had us in the same hotel. So Craig Mack invited us to his room to, you know, smoke some weed or whatever. And when we was in his room, I never forget, like we walked on the balcony. Because, you know, when you're in a hotel, you don't want the smoke to linger in the hallway to draw attention. So we, it was a balcony. So we, you know, it was all out on the balcony <laughs> as he rolling up his little chocolate tie weed. He like, yo, man, make sure your business is always right, man. Always be on top of your business. He, because the situation I'm in right now with Puff is, is all messed up. I'm trying to get out my contract right now. I'm trying to, like trying to get away from him right now like he got my whole contract like what up like basically saying like puffy was robbing him with no gun this ain't no disrespect to puff man big shots out to puff man the legend yeah but um yeah and then it's no secret that craig mack and biggie smalls didn't get along like they didn't even get along so yeah and I remember there was an awards show where Biggie and Craig were on stage and they were kind of promoting Craig Mack, supposedly his follow up album, which didn't come out for three years. But it seemed really awkward in their chemistry It's almost as if Big didn't want to talk about it. I don't know how to explain it, but it was just you could tell something was a little bit off between them. Yeah, definitely. I don't know why, but. Big and Craig Mack never like really got along like that. I'm not sure why, but yeah, man. So a lot of people don't know Craig Mack flew out Cali and was down with uh, Suge Knight for a minute. Oh, during I the, didn't know that. Yeah, during the whole Bad Boy, Death Row, Tupac, Biggie, everything. Like Craig Mack was down with Suge Knight, if I believe. So, oh, wow. yeah, like. Craig Mack definitely was blackballed. Okay, so you know Craig's big issue from what you think is, or what you were told was, it's something financially speaking, so he he was getting his share of Project Funk to World, The Flavor in Your Ear, his first album? Yeah, I think he was uh, basically saying Puff had 
percentages of his, his publishing. And, you know, as far as like his royalties, like, however, that was like negotiated. He felt like it wasn't fair. But every artist thinks that. <laughs> right. Like, I never forget. I'm going to leave this lawyer's name anonymous, right? This lawyer in New York City. Real big lawyer, right? I was doing a deal one time with an artist of mine at the time. So as we was talking about, you know, putting the contract together for the artists and the company, I'm trying to make sure the deal is like the, the most fair deal ever. Because this okay. was like a friend of mine's also. And the lawyer said to me, why are you, we got to, we got to create some type of space because if you give them everything they want, they still going to feel like they want more. And now you're not going to have no room to negotiate. So I'm like, well, I can understand that. So he like always get the most because none of these artists going to stick around after they blow up anyway. They all going to feel like they want to renegotiate their contracts. So even if you give them the most fair contract in the universe, they're going to feel like they should be getting more. So... That's why I never fought Puff. Like when I hear stuff about like Puffy, you know, like how he did his artist, I never fought him because like I I can understand his situ his position as far as like how my dad was, you know, as far as like a record company and stuff like that. It's just like embedded in us black people's DNA to find something to beef about another black person about. <laughs> so being as though the, your, their CEO is black, now they want to say the CEO is not fair. If they go to a clothes store and it's, the person is black at the clothes store, they're going to say he want too much money. They too high in that store. <laughs> like no matter what, like it's embedded subconsciously in black people's whole existence to have some type of beef with, a, with another black person. Like I don't know why. Well, I it's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy, man. So Craig Mack, the lawyer in Diddy, would you kind of blame all three in that scenario, would you think? I mean, I wouldn't blame them. I can't blame none of them because, like I said, even if an artist has the most fair deal in the universe, they still going to feel like they should be getting more after they blow up. Because when they first do the contract in the beginning, they're nothing. They not, they're not worth anything yet. And once their album comes and blows up, and now they're an asset to the company, as well as just period, they're an asset now. Now they got room to, you know, negotiate, renegotiate their contracts because the company is going to try to make sure they're the happiest they can possibly make the artists you know what I'm saying? Like, so the artists can perform to their best ability to continue to be the asset for them. So I don't, I don't fault Puffy. I don't fault the lawyers. I don't fault Craig Mack. That's just how business is. That's how business goes, man. So Project Funk the World, huge album, Flavor in Your Ear, Flavor in Your Ear remix, Get Down, huge song. So you couldn't ask for a better start being Craig Mack. Diddy is an ultimate businessman, and we, we know Diddy is a legend, but some things are confusing. So you would think he would know not to release Craig Mack's second album for over three years. You would think because he was so hot at the time, you'd want to get that done in a year, year and a half tops. That's something else that they're very vague about, and history doesn't really cover very well. Yeah, that's like the clearest sign possible to to know now that he purposely blackballed them. And, like, that's like one of the tricks in the industry. They put you on the shelf to cool you off. Knowing they had, they don't have it. They're, they have no intentions of your next album blowing up and selling a bunch of records again. <laughs> like, they're, whenever there's friction between, like, the company, the artist's whole career is in the company's hands, right? So the way these record companies are, if they fall out with the artist, they'll stall them out and have them working on their next album 
as long as possible to cool them off because the industry is a, 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 a constant evolving environment. You know what I'm saying? Music period, right? So they know another artist is going to come along any day, any week, that's going to have another hit record that's going to shift the attention over to them a little. They know this. Like, they're masters at, at the game. So they put people on the shelf as long as possible, and they, you know, cool them off. So now when they're done with you, you're not an asset no more. You can't go to another label and, and sign a bunch of money and, and sell a bunch of millions of records with them now and, and, and make them all the money now after they're the ones that created you. They don't want to see nobody else benef benefit and reap the benefits of something that they created. So they try to destroy you. So now you can't go nowhere and <laughs> like nobody wants to do business with you now. Like yet, yeah, yeah, has been. This is how they think. You know what I'm saying you're talking Diddy or whoever's in charge of the record label. And you're right. Just industry record company people. I did actually like his second album, Jock and My Style, I thought was a great song. But I understand what you're saying. But at the same time, isn't that bad business? Why would you want to put some, like a crap album out? I'm not saying his album's crap. I'm just saying something that's not as good. Bad Boy is huge. Wouldn't they want to stay consistent? Why would you just put something out just to put it out, even if it is three years later because you're mad at Craig Mack? Because now he got Biggie hot. He piggybacked Biggie off of Craig Mack's hotness at the time. When Flavor and Your Air was the hottest thing out, he put Biggie on a remix, on an all-star remix with all kinds of LL, Busta Rhymes. He put Biggie on that and broke him. He bro he used Flavor and Your Air to break Biggie. So now Biggie is hot. Now Biggie got the streets. He don't need Craig Mack no more. Because he's not thinking about one artist. He's thinking on a whole nother level. He's thinking company-wise. Now he can he can put any artist out and make them hot now. Because he'll piggyback them off of Biggie now. Same with the way how he did Total. Put Biggie on their song. You know what I'm saying? And Total was hot. Like that's how you do. Like, so he don't he didn't need Craig Mack no more at that at that point. You know what I'm saying? So. Sure. So when I think about groups and record labels, Bad Boy, Death Row, Rockefeller, whatever it may be, I almost look at you as a franchise or kind of compare it to a sports team. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Now, when the New England Patriots got rid of Tom Brady, they traded him. You don't just trade him or he doesn't just retire and you don't hear anything. You have an interview with Belichick, with Brady, the owner, things like that. Is it too much to ask, regardless if it's Craig Mack's fault or Diddy's fault? Because Craig Mack had a falling. How hard is it for Diddy to have an in-depth interview? This is what happened. We had a falling out. I think the fans deserve to know because I'm not just, you know, representing Bad Boy with my purchases. I mean, I'm not just a fan, I should say, but I'm also a customer with all the money I'm spending on the music, the merchandise. Don't we deserve as fans, at least, to know a little bit more instead of just having them kind of disappear? Yeah, absolutely. We should know, but the way the industry is... It's no different than politics. Politicians don't tell you what, everything that's really going on. They're, they're going to tell you what they think you would want to hear and what's best for you to hear on their behalf. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you're never going to know that type of stuff being on the outside looking in. That's why it's so valuable being in. Once you get in the industry, it's a small circle. Once you get in that circle, it's a circle like no other in the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Stuff that goes down behind behind the scenes, like as far as like strategies, business strategies, like it's just crazy. Like they're literally masterminds. It's like they're wizards or something. Like it's <laughs> it's nothing, it's nothing but magic and witchcraft in all actuality the music industry and promoting albums and stuff. That's nothing but, but witchcraft. If you consistently embed something in somebody's brain 
it it'll, it'll, it'll eventually make them accustomed to it naturally. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Psychologists, they even know if you do anything consistently for two weeks straight, it, can, it eventually becomes a habit, technically, at that point, two weeks. So that's what they do when they put these songs in rotation on huge platforms over and over and over again. <laughs> when you first hear it, you're like, man, I don't even like this. And then all of a sudden, it, it quote unquote grows on you. It didn't grow on you. you it was magic. They put on you. Yeah, it was magic. It was magic that you you're under a spell when you listen to music, literally. Sure. And your your theory about blackballing Craig Mack makes sense. And a lot of us in the nineties kind of suspected something was going on. You didn't have social media, so it was harder to access information. But then in 2002, randomly Craig Mack appears on the Let's Get It remix, which a lot of the fans were happy about. So it makes sense that he's blackballed at the same time. I guess they were close enough where Diddy could say, hey, can I feature you on the song real quick or something? Yeah, I think at that point he had came back and got back down with Puff. Okay. So he was back down with Bad Boy at that point. You know what I'm saying? So that's why Puff had put him on that because Bad Boy was on life support at that point because that was like rest in peace after Biggie was gone. Little Kim and them had, you know, rolled on and started doing their own thing. Like Puff was Puff was ice cold. Black Rob, rest in peace, was the one that kept Bad Boy alive with Woe. When Woe came, that was like right after the the uh No Way Out album. Puffy No Way Out album. That was mm -hmm. like after that had died down and all of that. Then Black Rob came with the Woe. So it was only Black Rob and G Dep that had uh, Bad Boy still lit for years at that around that time period. You know what I'm saying? So he needed Craig Mack. He probably looked at it like, well, Dan, let me see if I could bring Craig back over here to get a quick gold or platinum album out of him. It's all business. Everybody got selfish underground motives in that business. Gotcha. Regardless, rest in peace, Craig Mack. I'm a big fan. Rest in peace, Black Rob. You brought him up. Legends in my book. Yeah, rest in peace to both of them, man. Legends.